sound money in a non-interventionist foreign policy, and we do it through um, you know activism events on campus and around campus. And we also host speakers like Tom Woods, Ron Paul, and now we have Greg Luciano, who is the president of Fire. A little bit about Greg: he graduated from American University and Stanford University Law School. He worked for the ACLU of Northern California. He testified for the U.S. Senate about free speech issues. He was a guest on Glenn Beck, CBS Evening News, and Stossel. He was the first ever recipient of the Playboy Foundation Freedom of Expression Award. I don't know a lot about that, so you'll probably have to ask him what kind of uh, you know rights are, uh, you know, whatever that granted him. You may have got some, something special from that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so right, currently he's uh, he's the president of Fire which stands for the Foundation of Individual Rights and in Education. And uh, he fights for free speech on college campuses and promotes academic freedom. So uh, without further ado, I give you the president of FIRE, Greg Luciano. I kind of want to take this a little bit. Um, oh, but before I say anything else, 
uh, you know, it's a nice, nice intimate group. Um, so uh, my, my email is greg at thefire.org. Um, if you ever, you ever need to reach me, um, uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. Uh, friend me, follow, follow my tweets. Like kind of like just you know, stay in touch because it's really important. Um, what, when fire fights uh, uh, colleges, we, we take colleges on uh, one on one all, all the time. Um, but if it's uh, and we usually win just by, uh, just acting on our own. But when we actually have students on campus who are willing to defend their own rights, um, we're very hard to beat. So please do stay in touch. Um, so I, I might actually start by talking about the, uh, um, interestingly enough, the Rally Stewart Store Sanity, the John Stewart, uh, the John Stewart thing. Um, I wanted to, and I wanted to ask you guys, um, how many of you uh, know an educated person who tended to think that anyone who disagreed with his or her politics was more or less evil? Anyone? I should do. Um, how many of you know people who uh, believe that, um, it's, for some of you, promoting liberty or promoting social justice, um, for example, just meant, meant you're up to, up to no good in some way or didn't really understand the real world? Um, and how many of you have uh, educated friends who know precisely what their politics are, but have a very hard time explaining exactly why? Um, now, I see this on college camps all the time. Um, and I've seen it in my own life, uh, you know, it, it definitely for, for, you know, from working in restaurants to going to, uh, to, to going to Stanford Law School was a bit of a, a uh, culture shift. And I was struck in some ways that some of my most educated friends were the ones who were least able to explain why they believed what they believed. Um, and I, I'm, I'm working on a book called Unlearning Liberty that talks about this thing, um, that talks about the idea that these institutions that should be the best remedy for unsophisticated thinking are actually producing people that are even more reflexive in their beliefs and even more uncritical in their beliefs. And I think that that's in part due to the fact that you can actually get in trouble on a college campus for having the wrong view. Um, now, there's certainly a social uh, punishment for having the having wrong opinion, but, but flat out, you can actually get in trouble. Um, if you, if, uh, and it's funny because we have cases that, that, uh, uh, that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit where it's kind of hard to see the forest from the trees, to see what, what can actually get you in trouble and what can't. But if there's one thing that, that, I, that I've seen that is true, if you're on the wrong side, quote unquote wrong side, of any major political issue in the United States, I can point to at least one example of a student getting in trouble on a public college campus for being on that side. Whether it's immigration, abortion, affirmative action, war and terror, uh, Iraq war, it doesn't matter. Um, it, and if you actually have to fear getting in trouble for having the quote unquote wrong opinion, and universities cannot fulfill their function of making us deeper, more critical thinkers. Um, so this whole kind of like reflexive partisanship, um, uh, this whole kind of like people not really understanding why they believe what they believe in, is exactly what John Stuart Mill would predict a society that has fallen away from freedom of speech would look like. Um, he, 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 now, if you, if you haven't read uh, On Liberty, which he wrote in 1859, same year of uh, Origin of Species, um, I really recommend reading it because it's one of the clearest, uh, most definitive defenses of freedom of speech ever written. And one of the things that I, I, I take, and I could talk about that all night uh, by itself, but there's one uh, point that I, I've noticed in my work a lot at FIRE, is that people who aren't challenged, don't, don't have their beliefs challenged, tend to hold their beliefs the same way people hold prejudices. They don't know why they believe, but they're saying that they do. Um, and, uh, and it's funny because it, I, I'm very big, big into cognitive science and, and, and um, uh, Stephen Pinker, if you've heard of him, is one of our board of advisors. Um, our brains are kind of self-justifying machines um, that were really naturally good at figuring out why we were right about that thing we did five minutes ago. Um, so even though you've been brought up with an idea that free speech is important, and even though like, people talk about free speech being important, I think people underestimate it how important it really is. Um, as Jonathan Rauch wrote in a book called Kindly Inquisitors, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to talk about this in a different way that he talked about it, um, but I also highly recommend this book. Um, to a greater or lesser degree, we're all less blind. We're all biased. We all have uh, arguments that we can't quite hear or, or aren't willing to accept. And it's kind of funny because the postmodernists want to make the argument that because, you know, we can't know what truth is, or because there is no truth, or just we sort of fundamentally biased, that therefore free speech is meaningless. Now, this is an asinine idea. Um, it's, it's, it's a very complicated 
good argument that leads you back to a very simple question. Are you going to put truth in the hands of a small number of people, or are you going to let um, truth be open to everyone to discuss and debate? Um, and it's funny, postmodernists who actually advocated for speech codes believe that, well, we're so hopelessly biased and so hopeless, uh, there is no truth, so let's give five people the power to control speech. And it's like, but wait a second, aren't those five people also biased and don't know what truth is and, and fundamentally self interested? So all of these arguments ultimately are argue for a system that we have, that basically nobody gets to call special authority, no one gets to say, um, I know what's true uh, because I have a direct line to God. I mean, they can say that, but, but, they, but they can't actually enforce it. Um, and, uh, and that everyone gets to question everybody else. Now, it's messy. It's not necessarily uh, the, the quickest way, um, but one of the things that it allows for is the ability to, uh, it's something that uh, Karl Popper said that, that, that Rauch likes to quote, um, that in, a, uh, in an open society, we kill each other's ideas instead of killing each other. And this is one of these amazing things, and, I, and, and I, we've learned to take free speech for granted. We, we don't know how good we have it, we, and we don't know how bad things can be. Um, and currently, it's perfectly fine if you come up with six hypotheses uh, before breakfast about what, what's causing societal ills. And they can be shot down one by one. Nobody dies. Um, for most of history, if you actually had an idea that disagreed with the uh, political order of the time, you know, you might not necessarily be killed, but you, you think twice about opening your mouth about it. Now, what does this cause? What does this cause? This causes intellectual stagnation. This causes calcified thinking. This makes it impossible to actually intellectually innovate. Um, but partially because we think we have free speech, and, and we think that, um, uh, that that it's a collectively shared value, that we don't actually understand how stifling um, environments, particularly on, on college campuses, could often be to genuinely. Um, uh, uh, debating and throwing around ideas. Um, so the book that I'm working on um, is called Unlearning Liberty, and it takes a student, it takes a fictional student through um, uh, receiving the materials in the mail and doing the campus tour and uh, all this kind of stuff, and then it, talking about my experiences about how many bad lessons students learn about living in a free society before they even step foot in a classroom. And of course, these, this is at an institution that should be instilling you with the wild, crazy passion for living in a free society. And instead, I feel like they're, they're deeply undermining it. And I, and I think that uh, I think it would be really nice, given, given the hotness of the culture war, to actually have an institution that could be trusted as an honest broker to have meaningful debate discussion and train people to think critically about things. But I, I, I just can't believe, after 10 years of working for the department, that they're doing the job. Now, one of the things that I focus a lot in the book are, are the examples. You, you can't really teach someone something any better than by showing them examples of how it's done, or in this case, how it should be done. So I'm going to start talking about some of the worst examples that I've seen on campuses of, of, of how to live in a free society. And I'm going to start in Indiana, because how I'm in Indiana. Uh, three years ago, I, I don't know how many of you know this case, um, but uh, a student, uh, a student janitor, uh, middle-aged student, uh, working his way through uh, get, trying to get his communications um, degree. He was reading a book called Notre Dame versus the Klan. It's a book that celebrates the defeat of the Klan in a 1924 riot. It has pictures of uh, a, a, a Klan rally related to the riot on the cover. Because those pictures made one of his fellow employees uncomfortable, he was found guilty of racial harassment without a hearing. It took the combined efforts of fire, the ACLU, and the Wall Street Journal to get the university to back down. Nobody on that campus uh, came, uh, seriously rose to the student's defense, who again, literally judging a book by its cover, was found guilty of racial harassment. Now, you try to get a job with a finding of racial harassment on your, on your, on, on your file. And I mean, it, it, it made it sound more like he was actually a member of the Klan as opposed to actually reading a book about the defeat of it. And it's funny because the student actually went to the administration and tried to explain the content of the book that it wasn't actually a racist book and they didn't care. It was just enough that someone was offended. Now, things have to be really far gone before you start punishing people for the pictures on the covers of their books. Um, a a, a non-political example of just straight up authoritarianism happened in 2008 at Michigan State University where a student was